Today, I want to talk about a super helpful piece of kit that costs under $100, and I think that every vintage Mac enthusiast should have one in their arsenal. The original Intel MacBook. Apple announced the transition to Intel on June 6, 2005, and I remember that day because I was shocked. I was a Titanium PowerBook G4 user at the time, and I always thought that the PowerPC processors made the Macs really special versus all of the Wintel garbage out there. So I was firmly on the side of what is happening to Apple. But I really can't think of a more iconic computer from the mid-2000s than this white MacBook. It seemed like everybody had them. Um, the original one came out on May 16th, 2006. Uh, it was probably the third Intel model that Apple released. Um, and the one I have here is model 4.1, which is... Uh, from early 2008, and it's the lower spec of that generation. So this is 12 years old, which kind of really blows my mind because this is a relatively modern computer. It has uh, the Penryn Core 2 Duo at 2.1 gigahertz. Uh, it came with one gig of RAM stock, and it can go up to, well, technically up to six gigs of RAM, uh, with a four uh, gig stick and a two gig stick. Uh, Apple only ever said it could go up to two gigs, but uh, I'm going to put four gigs in here because the four gig module is like 50 bucks. And that's getting close to what these computers actually go for. And I think for what we'll use this for, uh, two two gig sticks for a total of four gigs is going to be more than enough. Uh, this originally came also with a very slow 5,400 RPM, 120 gig hard drive, but we're going to toss an SSD in there. Uh, and it also has a DVD CDRW combo drive, which unfortunately in this one is uh, a little under the weather, but I don't really care about that. This also importantly has Airport Extreme, which is ABGN, uh, and it has no trouble with modern Wi Fi, unlike my next newest Mac, which is my Titanium PowerBook, and that cannot talk to my Wi Fi router. Um, but most importantly, this has a great selection of ports on the side, uh, quite shocking compared to modern Macs, but the most important port and the reason why this is important for a vintage Mac enthusiast is it has a Firewire 400 port and this MacBook and the kind of spec bump that came right after this uh, they're the last ones that came with the Firewire 400 uh, the the unibody ones the next one after this style was the aluminum unibody uh, which looks a lot like the MacBook Pros that came out shortly after. That did not have FireWire. And then the white polycarbonate unibodies that came after that, which kind of look like this, but they were a solid piece of plastic and they had the trackpad without the button, and they also did not have FireWire. And this also has one of my favorite features of Macs from this era. This computer can work as an excellent bridge between modern Macs, modern software, modern internet, and your old Macs. Because Firewire means target disk mode, which means you can mount your old Macs as if they were Firewire external hard drives onto this new Mac. Well, reasonably new Mac. And these can be had on eBay for really next to nothing. I mean, I don't think uh, anyone really can use this era of Mac quite like Mac collectors can because this is only officially supports Mac OS Lion, um, can't be upgraded any further, 
And modern web browsers, Chrome and Firefox, do not support macOS Line anymore. In fact, on here, I have the interweb browser, which is made by the inexorable Wicknix, who makes tons of really cool software for our beloved aging Macs. So I got this particular model, uh, which is in really great condition, for $80 shipped. And that is literally less expensive than my cool Firewire enclosure from OWC, which when you consider the cost of this enclosure and the shipping and then the hard drive that I had to put into the enclosure and the shipping on that, uh, that's more expensive than this Mac. And now it's super common for these to be in kind of rough shape because there are a couple design flaws. Uh, most notably, up top here, there are two little plastic uh, indents meant to keep the screen from touching the keyboard when the lid is closed. But the plastic down here is not really that well reinforced. So it's super common for there to be huge cracks and holes right here, right where these plastic bits come into contact. Um, this one has very minimal cracking. Uh, there's like two hairline cracks down here. Um, and you can kind of see the indent from where these plastic bits come down. Uh, but there's no crack on the, the lid of here. So I'm very careful when I close this. Uh, there's a little bit of a crack up here on the bezel and that's pretty common for there to be all sorts of damage around these bezels. This is very thin plastic, but overall mine is in amazing shape and even more shocking was that this came with a working battery and this battery has, uh, probably its full original charge. I mean, right now I'm at 96%. And I've got five hours remaining, and this is at full brightness. So that was a very happy surprise. But why don't I show you the other thing that I think is really incredible about this particular generation of MacBook. This computer is shockingly easy to upgrade. And in fact, the only thing you need to remove is the battery. And then in here, there's three little screws. And these screws are even captive, which means you don't have to worry about losing them. Apple is just extremely excited for you to be able to upgrade this computer. So you just undo those three captive screws and remove the little memory cover. And then Apple even puts little levers in here that you can pull to eject the memory modules. I mean, they went out of their way to let you be able to upgrade this computer. And I think that's amazing. And new memory for this computer, I got these two two gigabyte modules off of Amazon for less than $20. Now, the four gig module is <laughs> shockingly expensive uh, at $50 for just that module. And I'm not spending $50 to get an extra two gigs of memory in an old computer like this. I think it will run just fine on four gigs. And then the hard drive is just as easy. And I've already put an SSD in here. It came with this kind of crap, 5,400 RPM, 160 gig drive. So I've just put a cheap Amazon 120 gig drive in here and it's super fast. All right, let's see if we have our four gigs of RAM. About this Mac. Yeah, look at that. 
4 gigs of 667 megahertz RAM. Now, another thing I did on this computer that was really convenient because I have this MacBook was I took this cool OWC Firewire enclosure with a 60 gig SSD that I tossed in here and I turned it into a PowerPC recovery drive. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So on this Firewire drive, I've made multiple partitions and I flashed the installers for all different versions of Mac OS X onto these different partitions. Uh, and then I've also made a stuff partition with a bunch of disk images. And then I've also made a live partition where I installed Mac OS X Tiger from this install partition here onto a dedicated like 20 gig partition on this Firewire drive. And that way I can boot uh, a Mac that's sick off of this Tiger Live partition. And then I can run tools and stuff on it. And then I also have a partition on here called Impossible Cat, which is me trying to get the uh, recently leaked beta of Snow Leopard that runs on PowerPC to run on my uh, Titanium PowerBook G4. So I think what I'm gonna do is dual boot Ubuntu 2004 alongside Mac OS 10.7 Lion. Uh, and that's gonna let me have a completely up-to-date operating system choice on here as well as an operating system to help me rescue Max. And it's actually really shocking. Ubuntu is very fast on here. Uh, this desktop, honestly, uh, with four gigs of RAM, this is smooth and responsive, uh, just as much as my daily driver laptop, which is uh, an order of magnitude faster with a 10th gen i7 and 64 gigs of RAM. So this with a Core 2 Duo and uh, four gigs of RAM now, uh, I think it's probably just fine. Uh, you could do regular web browsing on this with uh, modern up-to-date Firefox. I wonder if I could even run Slack on here. See, look how fast LibreOffice opens. That's really shocking, actually. Why are we buying all of these crazy powerful computers when you can have this for less than $100? And technically, this version of Ubuntu is newer than the version I'm using on my daily driver, which still has 1910. So this has the very fastest version of the kernel, like 5.3, I think. And yeah, I mean, GNOME has made a lot of improvements under the hood, which make this latest version of GNOME feel extremely fast uh, and just shockingly so on this 12 year old Mac. Yeah, so it's running 5.4. And everything supported, brightness works, sound works. Uh, Wi-Fi works if I install uh, the non-free drivers. Yeah, so I can turn on the Broadcom drivers here to use Wi-Fi. And, you know, with this kind of old hardware, I mean, support has been baked into the kernel for a long time. So it's all going to work. And again, I'm really shocked at how fast and responsive this desktop is. So I think I'll do a video on dual booting this computer with 
the latest Ubuntu and Mac OS Lion. Um, Cause that's definitely something I'd like to do. But anyway, the version of this computer that I think you should look for is the 4X revision, which is late 2008, early 2008. Uh, the one that came after this, actually the 5X versions, uh, they were kind of a quietly released upgrade to this model. And they had, um, they actually can support later versions of Mac OS than Lion. Uh, and the people selling them know that. And they usually sell for much more, I think kind of a ridiculous price. I mean, if you can find one for a hundred bucks or less, go for it. But usually they're like 150, $200. And for the reason that I think that we should have these handy, which is modern computer with firewire. Uh, I think you can't go wrong with a $50 4X version like this 4.1 MacBook. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And I will see you in the next video.